live streaming is on. Hello, I think we are online. Let me check as usual, people. Hello, everybody. First, let me check if we are online because YouTube doesn't refresh itself. If I don't do it for it because YouTube is an idiot, then they're censoring for saying these things. But we are online. Hello, everybody. How are you? And hello on the other side of this, my dear old friend, the master genius, and hello. many other things aside of the one of the most hilarious people in the world. Hello, Mr. Dave Demons. How are you? Hello there, Mr. Dave Macho. I'm fine. I I'm not so keen on the old, although we have been friends for a long, long time. I'm, I was trying That's to true. figure when we first met. I'm not actually absolutely sure when it was. It's got to be 15 years ago, more probably. Oh, much more. Much yeah. more. Much more. Much more. It's got to be at least, at least 20, at 20. least 20 for sure. But, and I think more than that. Really? More, I think more than that. Yeah. It's got to be that. Uh, I remember one con you came to the, to Barcelona when Norma was editing. Um, we had talked before, but I think yeah. not in person. In, in, in Norma uh, was doing a steel DC and they had invited you to the Watchmen and we met at the bar because right. you were just going around and we just sat down and I started talking, talking and talking. Was, was this the convention? Was this the convention where it was in the, in the train station, in the railway the station? station. In a train yeah, station. I, yeah, when it was I still remember in the that. Station. That was a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, not we are not all. We are vintage. So let's not say all friends. Let's say classic friends. Did you we're want just to? Fine, we're just like two fine wines. We're just ma maturing and becoming more delicious every year. But yeah, you, man, you look delicious. <laughs> <laughs> so how have you been? How's things for you, the family? Aside of, as I always say in these videos, we're living through the most boring apocalypse in the history of apocalypses. Yeah. How is it with you? It's just like one long kind of Sunday or one long, you know, that time between Christmas and the New Year where nothing really seems to happen everywhere is shut. I mean, I'm, I'm not making light of it. We find ourselves in a very lucky bubble, actually. We live in a nice part, part of England. Um, we, we're safe and secure. We've got family around us. We've got good neighbours. Um, so in our li little bubble, things are okay. And in fact, from day to day, it's not that much different than the life I've lived anyway. You know, I mean, I've kind of been in kind of isolation for the past 50 years, drawing comics, much more of a voluntary isolation. And then when you go to a comic convention, the first thing you make sure you do is wash your hands thoroughly before you eat or, yep. or, or touch anything. So it, it, it's, it's weird. It, it doesn't feel that different. Um, but I know for a lot of people, it, it's, it, it's quite hard. And I think one of the things is that people can feel very isolated, which is why I find myself doing a lot of these talks, because not only is it nice to talk to old friends like, like you and have a, a good, good conversation that's perhaps overdue, but also, you know, to reach out to readers and fans and, you know, kind of maintain that sense of community and that feeling that we're, we're all kind of in this thing, thing together. Yeah. And I think what I think what it what it also highlights is how important entertainment is. I mean, we've spent our lives in the entertainment business to have good entertainment, to have distraction from the events of life is sometimes a very valuable thing. So, yeah, I mean, I like everybody else, um, you know, going through the strangest of times. But in my p particular case, uh, you know, we're, we're doing OK. Yeah, but that's exactly, well, you know, this is exactly why I'm doing this. You know, when people ask me why I'm doing mm -hmm. these chats, it's exactly because of that, because I want people to see that other side of you, you know, the community side, the personal side, mm -hmm. the artist side will come when the guys, you know, you're dying to ask questions. They will mm -hmm. come, they will come, <laughs> don't worry, they will come. Uh, but, uh, so so how, how about you, David? How are you doing? You, you, you live quite near to Barcelona, I know. Yeah, we are, we are the first exit in, uh, the first exit in uh, direction north, you know, direction France from Barcelona. Uh, we're fine because we have, you know, like a big lake and a forest nearby. Mm -hmm. So to go with the with the dog and all that. And uh, since the it's really strict measures that the Spanish government applied yeah. seem to be working, they are, you know, doing um, the de-escalation, to say mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. It's happening in phases, you know. Yeah. So, for example, Galicia is also already in phase two, close to phase three. Phase four is back to normal, in a way, okay? Yeah, uh, yeah. But, but Barcelona and Madrid are still in phase one yeah. because I mean, they are the most densely populated so the still distance you can go out only in certain times of the day etc etc yeah well well that's true i think the other thing which makes it surreal 
is, you know, England isn't famous for good weather, but we've had the most wonderful weather. It's bright sunshine out, outside. We've, we've, the, the whole weekend is going to be bright and sunny. Last weekend was bright, br bright and sunny. And again, nobody thought that the slow motion apocalypse would happen in be beautiful weather. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's so bizarre. And well, you know, um, I think the effects of it are going to go on long, long after we've got on top of the virus and the infection. It's, I think it's going to so change people's lives. And I mean, I was listening to Mike Mignola talk, talking this morning, saying that where, where he lives, when you walk down the street and you see somebody on the same side of the street, you immediately start to worry who's going to cross, cross over the road. And you, th you can hardly believe that there could be such a thing as San Diego Comic Convention. You know, to be in the middle of all those people, it seems surreal now. And I think it's going to take a time to um, adjust to that. I'm sure people will. But I think it's going to have a huge effect on people's be, be behaviour and I think values as well. And I think it's put a lot of things in perspective for people. Um, and um, I don't think you can say that it, it was a good thing, but I think there's some kind of reset. I hope there's some kind of beneficial reset of human society going to go on. But anyway, I'm, I'm just a just a comic book artists, I don't, no, I don't no, know. No, I, I completely agree with you and, and I hope so too because, you know, we've seen that because of how the world literally had to stop, we've seen how, you know, climate change in a way has been reversed, you know, mm -hmm. skies, uh, animals returning, you know, taking, uh, taking again uh, the rightful place, you know, going back to beaches or going back to places where you haven't seen them in, in, yeah. uh, in 40 years and things like that. So the, if we don't uh, do that tra ecological trans transition now, if that even makes sense in English, mm -hmm. when are we going to do it? Yeah, yeah. Well, it just shows you that it is possible, you know, and, and it can be a better place. So anyway, enough, in, enough philosophy, enough current affairs. We're almost straying into politics, which I always studiously avoid. So <laughs> we are not going later. together. Don't worry, we are not going together. <laughs> so... Uh, What's the last movie you remember having watched in a theater before this? It was it was the Japanese movie that won the Oscar. It was called it was called Parasite. South Korean. S South, South Korean pa Parasite. A fantastic yeah. movie, and it was really strange because we went to sit, and it was virtually the last evening that we went out. We went for something to eat with some friends. And then we went to the movies. But the thing about it was, I'm a fairly tall guy, but I found myself sat behind a very tall guy. So I watched most of the movie like this, <laughs> look, looking over the guy's shoulder, and then he'd move, and then I'd have to go, go like this. And at first I thought, I'm not going to be able to stand this. But the movie was so good that despite that, I, I thought it was one of the most remarkable films I've seen in years. And I can see why it won, won the Oscar as well. Um, mm -hmm. And a very memorable film, one of those films that you find yourself thinking about afterwards. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so that was the last time uh, we went to the movies. Yeah, and are you watching a lot of uh, TV shows now on TV or, or, or movies? What are you, you know, in my case, I, I think you saw it in other, you know, chats. For yeah. whatever reason, not intentional, I came back, I've come back to watch classic movies. Yeah. Because I'm we just created with TV shows. Yeah, we kind of, I think we're starting to get to the end of the TV shows that we really want to see. I mean, one thing that you feel as you, as you look at the endless listings on Netflix <laughs> and Amazon is, I wish I hadn't watched, watched that series because it was so good. I'd really like to watch it now. The thing we're watching at the, at the moment is um, I bought a new iMac for my wife who does the business side of my operation and she hadn't had a new iMac for 10 years. So I treated her to a new iMac to do, to do the accounts and everything on. And because of that, we got a year's free subscription to Apple Plus. There you go. Yeah. Um, and the thing we're watching at the moment is a series on there called Defending Jacob. Oh, the Chris Evans one. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's such a good movie. And he's such a good actor. I mean, you obviously think of him as Captain America. He's a brilliant actor. He's got a great British, um, a great British actress um, mm -hmm. in there, Mich Michelle Dockery, who I've always thought was a bit of a kind of cold personality. But her acting is just fantastic. So, I would be surprised because I, I remember her from Down, Downton Abbey. Yeah. So I thought it was going to be just the same model of, you know, British, really. Yeah. Stiff up a lip. Exactly. Stiff, uh, <laughs> I didn't want to say it, but yeah, that yeah. kind of acting. But then I saw her on this on this show and I was like, whoa, what's yeah. that change? That seems really good. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so that's what we're watching at the moment. We're watching Killing Eve as well. I'm not sure if that's even finished. Yep. Um, yeah. So just just the usual mishmash of things. We we, we 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 actually watched. I persuaded my wife to watch the last Star Wars trilogy, which I'd seen at the seen at the movies. But we actually sat and over three nights watched that, and we both really enjoyed it again. And she liked it as well, because when she came to the movies with me to see it on the big screen, because I'm a fan, I'm going, shh, shh, shh. And I don't, I don't, don't want to talk, don't want any disturbance, any distraction. But when you're watching it at home, you can pause and go, oh, no, he's the guy who blah, 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 blah. So we really enjoyed watching that. Um, we might watch Lord of the Rings again, just because it has been a while. Uh -huh. And I keep thinking of odd scenes in that, but... Yeah, it's, 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 it's strange. I mean, I, I just think it, it's amazing that this has all happened when there is such an amazing amount of entertainment out, out there. Of course, we watched, the thing I watched before that was Watchmen, the HBO Watchmen series, which we may well be talking about later. And again, I wish I hadn't watched that because I'd like to watch it now, but I might watch that again anyway, except I'm going to have to pay for it. And I, I don't want to pay for it. I do you, what do I have to you, pay for you know it. Do you know how HBO? Uh, no, we didn't have HBO. We took out a subscription on now. Wait, 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 wait. Warner, Warner hasn't sent you the freaking, the freaking show. Not yet. No, they they did send me a link to it where I could watch it under conditions of secrecy. But that meant that, that it had my name watermarked across it, yeah. and it had a time ticker going on it and everything. So I thought, well, I don't mind forking out twenty pounds to see it on on the TV. But no doubt they're waiting to send me the Blu-ray and the and the DVD and everything. But yeah, uh, <laughs> they they came <gain> that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'd be nice. Be a nice thought. Well, uh, you gotta watch. Have you ever watched a show that is uh, called Silicon Valley? Haven't seen that one. No. Okay, this this one on uh, Let me explain why. This is show now on Apple TV Plus. Yeah. That is uh, Mythic Quest, mm -hmm. which is incredibly good. Yeah. And it's the same creators that made uh, before for HBO, they did Silicon Valley. Oh, right. Silicon okay. Valley was guys, a comedy set in, you know, in the world of, of course, Silicon Valley, yep. the computer guys, the geeks. And uh, this one uh, is guys who create, uh, you know, like a multiplayer video game. Right. And it's incredibly funny. And I won't say why, but four okay. fifth episode makes a real change in tone. Okay, um, I I've, 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 like, oh my god, I could never, I never expect this, and it's really, really good. I've, I've made, made a note of that we did, we did enjoy devs. Uh, devs was very en en entertaining, you know, um, and and it was quite a, a deep and serious subject, but it had a great atmosphere to it, a really good mood. So I'm, um, uh, yes, yeah, so I enjoyed that. But I, I, I made a note, David, Mythic Quest, Silicon mm -hmm. Valley. I should get those watched. So the next time I'm there, going. Ah, oh, there's all these programs, but there's nothing I want to see. Then I can watch one of them. It's either that or watching Fraggle Rock. Yeah, because they, <laughs> Fraggle they, Rock, my favourite. They started Fraggle Rock again on Apple TV Plus. I realised <laughs> today, and the kid has been watching it all day. So, <laughs> oh really? <laughs> yeah. well, it, well, it may even come to that. Who, who knows how long this is all going to go? On. It may even come to that. <laughs> what? I've seen it all. Watch it all. Okay, Fraggle Rock. You know what? Yeah. Fuck it. It's the last one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when you are. When you write or draw, yeah, um, do you have a soundtrack? And I mean, is there any music around you? Because I've heard, you know, from different artists, like for example, Olivier Coipel, you talk to him and says, when I'm doing a layout, I don't want any noise around me. It's mm -hmm. a bit quiet because that's when I, you know, composing, yeah. uh, the storytelling where everything, the placement of everything, and I want to be, you know, completely concentrated. But when I go to pencils or inks, since it's just a little bit more mechanical, then I have music to, I need epics. As yeah. an ep so I have, you know, Last of Mohicans. I need intimate. I go with, you know, romantic French uh, um, classical music or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't do it in quite as focused a way as that. I mean, I've always had this theory. I mean, just as comics is like a visual track and a word track, mm -hmm. that, that when you're doing the layouts, that's almost entirely visual. So, so, well, no, 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 no. It's no, it's not. It's visual, and it is the words as well, because that's where the story happens. That's where you weld the two together. Yeah. So you haven't got a lot of spare bandwidth. So typically, if I was writing or I was laying stuff out, doing the real difficult storytelling, I would have silence. You know, not 
when I say complete silence, I don't mind a bit of ambient noise. I don't mind the birds singing or traffic going by or people people talking in another part of the house. But I can't really concentrate on listening to anything other than my own thoughts. Then when it comes to penciling, I can listen to kind of music that hasn't particularly got words mm -hmm. because, you, you know, I used to Atlantic and then the house. Are we still there? Yes, we, you, I lost you for a, for a few seconds. Did you okay, okay. So I would listen to stuff like that, stuff that might might have a rhythm to it, but nothing too obtrusive. And then when I would come to actually ink something in, I can listen. I can hold a conversation. I can talk to somebody. I I listen to a lot of drama. I can listen to uh, plays and readings on the radio, and that's absolutely fine. And it's almost like it, it gives your mind something to chew on while the your body's doing what it does without being consciously in, interrupted. So, yeah, it, it, it does have that strange thing. I've also experimented. There's a thing called focus at will mm -hmm. where you kind of put, put into it whether you want high energy, low energy, medium energy, whether you want a kind of ambient, whether, whether you want a beat, you know, and, and it will play you the kind of music in chunks that are measured out, that they start off very uh, energetic. And then as you start to fade, they get more and more energetic to try and keep your level exactly the same. I'm not sure if they work. You know, I'd be interested to know whether any piece of music would, would, would have that effect as well. But I kind of, kind of played with things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, the thing that I really have found is that all these years drawing comics has made me really good at kind of quizzes and things like that because you listen to so much unrelated trivia when you're mm -hmm. listening to the to the radio that, that that you retain and it's all the kind of stuff that no one's in, in interested in but it's really handy if you're doing a quiz in a pub or something like that so that's one of the benefits of drawing comics anyway mm -hmm. and uh, and when you're writing you need uh, to what's 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 your method there you know instead in terms of same same thing yeah, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't wouldn't have any noise noise on at all because there's there's a funny thing you almost start to type in tune or you type with the rhythm of what you're listening to it gives the words the kind of poetic rhythm gets the rhythm of, of what, whatever you're listening to so i would always have complete silence for the bit where i'm actually coming up with the story when you're just as, as it were typing it up that isn't so crucial then mm -hmm. um so yeah that's that's kind of how it goes and uh where do you think um oh let's change the subject What's your favorite music? What's your favorite music to listen to in uh, no comics, whatever? Just you know, going back to the classics of your childhood or the, yeah. or the music to listen to now. Well, there was a time when I used to be be very, very uh, kind of fanish about about music. You know, I, there was certain bands that I would follow and certain kinds of music that I'd buy every time they had a new release out. And I knew everything that was in the top 20 or the top 40 or whatever. But at some point, and I don't know when it was, I just, that kind of, it all kind of passed me by. In the 90s, as I say, I used to like to listen, in the early 2000s, I used to listen to a lot of dance music, a lot of kind of um, um, acid house stuff, yeah. just because I liked the kind of texture of it. But I think what I really like, the music I've always really liked, and it's funny because it is kind of a parallel with comics, in that comics are a hybrid art where you've got, as I said before, a visual track and a word track. To me, the best songs have got that. They've got, they work as a whole and as a whole, they're bigger than the sum of the music and the sum mm -hmm. of the words. So yeah. I like people who write really clever songs. I mean, I obviously used to like uh, Bob Dylan. I mean, I can remember the first time I heard Bob Dylan. I couldn't believe you could do such things with a, with a song. So I've always been a huge fan of his, which, of course, made it particularly sweet when they used several of his tracks on the movie adaptation of Watchmen. Yep. And I understand that actually they had to get Dylan's permission to use it, particularly the opening sequence of the, the Watchmen movie, where it's the montage of all, all the characters. That's the times they are changing, but it's not the original mix. And he actually allowed them to remix it. 
So the thought that maybe Bob Dylan is, is aware of Watchmen gives me a huge thrill. Yeah. Well. <laughs> but, 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 but then I suppose coming after that, I, in the heyday when I would listen to music, I like, I like people like Crowded House or Elvis Costello or Lloyd Cole and those kind of people who would, who would craft good, good songs. Aztec Camera, I used to, used to really like at one point. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's that kind of stuff. Nowadays, I tend to listen to Spotify playlists, which either are m music from when I was a kid, or I'll sometimes go off on a kind of artist of the day. I'll think, oh, I, I really love David Bowie. I'll have a David Bowie day, and I'll just yeah. let his music yeah. play all day. The thing I did the other week, there's a, there's a British singer a bit before even my time, and he was the sort of British Frank Sinatra, a, call, a guy called Matt Monroe, and he had a wonderful kind of like baritone voice, you know, perfect crooner's voice. And I used to think he was a bit schmaltzy, but I heard a track of his on the radio and I thought, that guy can really sing, just like Otis Redding can really sing, but Matt Monroe can really sing. Yeah. And so I had a day just of these schmaltzy old ballads and I was singing along to them and I really, really loved them. So I am very old school when it, when it comes to music, but as they mm -hmm. say, I know what I like. Yeah, but the, uh, back in the day, you as you were a mob. Yeah, and uh, the it, it, well, at that era, that was a specific kind of music you like that was related or not? Oh, sure, yeah, and and I mean, I've 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 got a, um, a, a playlist which is the originals playlist, and it's got mm -hmm. a little. In, in fact, you could probably, if you went on Spotify and searched for the originals and my name, you could probably find the playlist. But it is, yeah, it's my compilation, my mixtape of all those songs that I love then. And I only have to hear them, and it kind of takes me right back there. And they still stand up. I mean, by today's standards, some of them are quite crude, and I think a lot of them were recorded in mono, mm -hmm. and, the, and the, the sound balance is bad, but the feeling and the excitement, and I only have to hear certain drum breaks or certain intros, and it just, just, just gets me all fired up again. It, so, it, it, it takes you back then? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is not to say I'm not one of those people who go, old music was better. You kids nowadays. No, no, no. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not suggesting no, no, that. Oh, no, I know, no, I know, but it's a really good thing not to like your children's music because that shows that your children are moving on. If, if I liked everything that I'd ever heard my children play, they'd be going wrong somehow, you know? It's, it is the purpose. <laughs> it is the purpose of music to wake people up and to mm -hmm. give them an enthusiasm and to speak to them and them, them alone, you know? So, yeah, uh, yeah. But, but as I say, there is that interesting thing. I was listening to somebody the other day. I think it was Brandon McCarthy who was on a, on a chat like this, and he was saying how he sometimes conceives of comics in musical terms. And I think that's very true, you know, the way mm -hmm. that the words carry part of it, the pictures carry part of it, and you put them both together and you come up with something which is neither. It's both but neither. Um, and so yeah. there are great parallels there. Okay. I, think. I, I, I think that, you know, for... You for Frank for the people who you know does also writing and uh, writing and drawing <laughs> at the same time or separate you know sometimes you do writing sometimes you do drawing mm -hmm. creating a comic has gotta be in a way like composing a song as you're saying because you put two things together m music and lyrics in a song and you know the words and the images in comics yeah yeah and and it's that it's that bit in in the middle you know this was always fascinating me about comics it's where the pictures and the words meet. And, you know, you don't get that in any other art form. I don't think in quite the same way. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I still think for something so simple, the permutations still haven't been explored. It's, it's amazing that comics have been around for so long, but you will still get striking bits of, of, of storytelling. I was, um, I was saying to somebody the, the other day about uh, my favourite Batman comic, which is Batman Year One by Frank Miller and David, David Mazzuccelli. And there's a, wonderful, there's a wonderful scene change in that. It's just brilliant. It's where, because uh, um, Batman Year One, it's as much the origin of Commissioner Gordon as it is the origin of, Absolutely. of, of, of Batman. And there's this scene in it where Commissioner Gordon has found himself posted to Gotham City. His wife's pregnant. He's sat on the edge of the bed. It's the middle of the night. He can't sleep. He's smoking a cigarette. And he's thinking something along the lines of, what have I done? What am I doing here in a city without hope? And the next picture is a tiny sliver of a picture, uh, the skyline of Gotham, and a tiny figure wearing a bat costume. 
And it's just perfect. It's not a massive splash thing. It's not, here comes Batman. It's a whisper of hope. And it's the juxtaposition of what Gordon has just said next to that picture. It's just, just sublime. So, you know, though, that's the kind of thing you can do with a, with a good comic. That's the part that saddens me the most, precisely, to see that the language of comics, I understand the machine has to keep pranking comics, it's got to go out every month because of how, that's how the American market works, blah, blah, blah. But it makes me really sad that to see that uh, using the comics, as you said, you know, for going through with different languages at the same time, with just a position, different moments, you know, uh, using different times with the art, that you use with the writing or mm -hmm. vice versa, you know, or mm -hmm. telling a story as you guys did in Watchmen or Martha Washington or your own work mm -hmm. alone is, I, I have to, I cannot, I can play in comics with time mm -hmm. in a way that you cannot play in any other art film. You just can't. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's true. And it's that juxtaposition of kind of space and time because the space you give something governs the time that it, that it, that it occupies. So there's a weird kind of alchemy going on there as well. And I think you see these things. I mean, pa paradoxically, a lot of the most popular comics are the ones that are all very high key. It's, it's bang, bang out cinematic action and people getting punched through walls and things exploding and spaceships crashing and everything like that. And that's fine. You can do that in comics, but it's the subtle moments. And that's why I mm -hmm. think that's why I think I'm also attracted to comic artists who can do the subtle moment. I mean, we've spoken before about Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, who's a huge, huge favorite of mine, who, in fact, I'm still very grateful to you and Paloma. You actually gave me like the complete kind of Garcia Lopez Superman comics in, yep. in Spanish, which, which is fine. Um, and it's just great to, to actually have those. But Garcia Lopez is the master of the of the subtle moment. Yes. I mean, I mean, to, he can draw two people having a phone conversation or somebody closing a door. And it's just got all the drama and all the interest that the fastest action scene would have. So I think the more I go on, the more I become aware of subtlety and, and you know, the, 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 the finesse of really good comic creators. I agree. I agree. I think that nuance, you know, the more nuance, the more subtle, the more playful, in a way. I, maybe that's not the word. The more playful it, it, a comic go, is with, with the art form. If you know what I mean, mm -hmm. uh, this is street rules, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. But the other day I was asking, you know, Cerello about um, the juxtaposition in his case of, you know, design and, and pure art, you know, as mm -hmm. an art director and also as an artist, because he did, you know, he's a designer as much as he's an artist. Mm -hmm. And he told me, look, I asked Alex Toth the same question. And you know what he said to me? That's the most stupid question ever. <laughs> you just do it. Yes. You just don't, you know, the way to do a good comic is to not think about it. You just do it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's it's a matter of feeling as much as calculation, you know. It isn't a cold cut. I mean, you can do it like that and you can get a kind of a roadmap, but it's the it's the little things that you don't plan. It's the little juxtapositions. I mean, I've 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 had the experience of writing for other people to draw and I've had some really good artists like Garcia Lopez, like Steve Rude, uh, like Mike Mignola even. And they've all had something to it that was net that I had hadn't put there. There was a scene in the thing I I did that Steve Rude drew, which was called World's Finest, which World's was Finest, yeah. Bat, Bat, Batman Superman. There was a scene in it where Bruce Wayne had been hitting on Lois Lane, and she was turning him away, and Steve drew her going, blowing up her hair in that kind of. Thank God that's over over with. And I hadn't thought of that. I hadn't described it, but Steve put that little touch in it, and immediately she came came alive. You know, it's it, it, it is it is wonderful when when things like that happen. And again, when you're really cooking on a on a comic, as I think Steve was then, there's this sense of you're all, you're almost inside the comic. You're in the picture. You you start to draw, and you're drawing into the picture, and that world is closing around you. And I mean, I've been very lucky because not only have I written scripts for great artists, but I've been had scripts written by great writers for me. And a really good script can do that to you. It can take you into a different place where you start to see the world differently and get completely lost in it. Lost in a way that you get when you're watching a good piece of entertainment, when you're really immersed in reading a comic or you're caught up in a movie or even a piece of music. 
So I think that's the trick. You take something which is pretty basic, which is marks on a piece of paper, and you give somebody an experience that they can get lost inside. So, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm sure one day I'm going to have to write a very scholarly book about this. But it's it's a really interesting thing. And the more you go on, the more you realize the subtleties of it, you know, yeah. and what, what can be done. Yeah, I was, um, uh, you know, one thing that I keep thinking about uh, comic writing these days, and not only these days, you know, it happened in the past too, and, and I'm sure you've gone through it as an artist. It's the difference, that, the, the real palpable difference I see when, let me say, let me see if I can explain it correctly. A writer wants to involve the artist in the story. Mm -hmm. you, know, you are part of the fun and I'm going to make you enjoy it. Mm -hmm. You know, like, and I am not, not don't mean, you know, typical monthly where you don't even know when you write it, who's going to, who's going to draw it because, you know, it happens and it says written by Dave Gibbons, art by line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, in a case where, you know, this guy is going to write it, it's going to draw it. Sorry. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, I want, I'm going to make him have fun. I know what he likes to draw and I know what he doesn't like to draw. Mm -hmm. Many cases I see that writers these days, and again, not only these days, because I'm sure you've suffered it in the past. They just write what they like to write, mm -hmm. but they don't take into account what the artist would like to do. Yes. And that's what produces the comics without those nuances, as you said. Yeah, yeah. Because when he, if the artist is involved, what is he gonna go? Is he's gonna give you he's gonna try to give you the fun back? It's like, oh, you, you made me have fun. This is what I get you in return, so you enjoy it. Sure. And I think, think the I think the best writers of comics have very visual imaginations, and I think it's really a great advantage to know who the artist is going to be because if you are an artist, a writer who's got a good visual imagination, you can imagine it as drawn by that artist before he's even drawn it. You can imagine a Mike Mignola figure, you know, or or, or you can imagine a Gary Frank superhero or, 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 or something. And it helps, it kind of, it's part of the spell, you know, that, that, that you're, you're, you're putting the ingredients in there that you know the other guy can do magic with. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's 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 a fascinating thing, and I mean that it is also particularly the thing about comics that, by and large, it is a very collaborative collaborative art yeah. form, and that's the aspect of it that I think I've always really um, enjoyed. You know, to work with a friend, you're literally having fun, and it's like you used to do when you were a kid. It's I know that's that's the bad guy's fault. I'm going to go around this way, and I'm going to ambush him. You go in there, and when you hear me shout, you. You know, it's, it's like playing some kind of wonderful game. And I think a lot of the things that I've enjoyed the most, it really hasn't felt like work. There's been a deadline. There's been a certain expectation. But it doesn't feel like work. It feels mm -hmm. like some form of play. Um, so, yeah. And um, just to mention something, because you may have been going to ask me or somebody's going to ask me, so what are you working on at the moment, Dave? I'm sure you wouldn't ask me such an obvious question as that. But... <laughs> What, but, okay, where are you working on this moment, Dave? Well, funny you should ask me that, David, because no, I'm I'm uh, I'm working on a video game. I I I collaborate with some friends of mine back in as long ago in the, as the '90s on a game called Beneath a Steel Sky, which mm -hmm. was out on the PC and the the Amiga, which we later repurposed for handheld devices, iPads, iPhones, Android, and it was very very successful. Um, and so the de developers suggested that we do another game to, to, together, do a sequel to Beneath the Steel Sky. And we have, and it's called Beyond the Steel Sky. Um, and it's actually going to be out on Apple Arcade. Apple were very interested in the game. So we've been developing it for them. And it's going to be out very, very soon. And it isn't like the original game, which was kind of little pixelated sprites walking in front of painted backgrounds. This is full 3D. It's 3D with a really, really clever, what they call a tune render, you know, which mm -hmm. gives it an outline so it looks like a comic book. Um, and I've done character designs, environment designs, story input on that. And nice. I've had the time of my life because just like comics, it's a collaborative industry. And, of course, nowadays we've got this where we can have video chats we can show screens we can sketch and the other guy can see it sit on his monitor and i've had the real time in my life doing that and again it's because it, it, it's a great game by the way but not but not only that it's been the collaboration and the feeling of getting together with other people and coming up with something that none of you could have ever come up with on your on your own and seeing things go from my little gestural scribbles of costume designs into more finished artwork 
and then into actually actual 3D models, and then into 3D models that run and jump about the place. So that's been the thing that, in a way, I've been getting my collaborative kicks there at a point where I'm not drawing so many comics as I used to. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that's, that's the aspect of it, is it's the... The whole being greater than the sum of the parts. I think that's that's what that's I'm amazing. Saying. So Apple Arcade coming soon, beyond the coming steel soon. sky. Ho hopefully, I think June. I'm, I'm not sure June, July, but it's it's almost here. And I've I've, I've had a playthrough of, of the whole game, and I'm absolutely thrilled and blown away by it. So uh, I am subscribed. So as soon as it comes, I will play it. Don't good. Worry. And and of course, because I designed the characters and, yep. and did a lot did a lot of the artwork, it's got that sort of Dave Gibbons feel to it. So, it, it, as I say, it just feels like a world that I've helped create just really come alive. So Nice, yeah. nice. Uh, if I forgot to ask you before this, and then I will go and... Guys, I know you're asking a lot of questions. I see you. I will go there now. Uh, are there, you know, same ever coming back, or do you think that that story is done and... Well, it's, it's, it's funny, you know, because I, I just said how much I enjoy collaboration. The thing with the originals was... I didn't collaborate with anybody in that. I just did it myself. And that was a really weird experience. It took me almost a couple of years to do. And we'd moved house and I, I had to rent a studio for a while. And it was this studio that was up in a roof and it had one little skylight that you couldn't even see the ground. You could just see a patch of sky. And I sat in this room on my own, writing and drawing this thing. And I got all this artistic doubt, you know, does anybody care about this? At least if you're working with a writer or an artist and go, hey, this is really good. Or I can go, hey, this stinks, you know, but just does does any anybody care? And then eventually I got done on it. And I suppose not to tell the story just to make myself look good, but I did end up with an Eisner Award. So that was good. And, and my wife and stepdaughters were in the audience. So at least they saw me pick up the award for all the misery they suffered while I was so grumpy because I wasn't having a good time stuck in a room on, <laughs> on, on my own like that. Anyway, anyway, so, you know, I thought, well, that's the originals. I'm done with it. I told the story. But somewhere in the back of my mind, there's a little germ of an idea and I'm trying not to let it develop, but it keeps developing. <laughs> and I see things and I think that would be good. It's, well... But the only thing about it is I would have to write and draw it. Really, it would have to be all me because it's kind of autobiographical. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in a way it's you, of course. Yeah, I got yeah it. so really it's a question of, it's almost like when you, you're developing a story, I suppose it's almost like speaking as a man, almost like a pregnancy, that, that it starts and you're not quite sure how it started, but it starts and you've got a, got a vague idea why. And then it develops and develops. And then it gets to the point where it's going to have to be born. There's nothing you can do. You've got this idea and you're so now so full of it that you've got to express it. I'm not quite there yet. And it needs another couple of things to drop into place. And it also needs me to have the courage to think, OK, here we go. In prison for another two years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but but I don't think it's going to be as long as the originals. But it's I have got what I think is a really good idea for it. And so, certainly um, it's something that's bub bubbling away there. So, yeah, that's that's the story of the originals. Yeah, so you can you know, guys, every time I see him on most, I ask the same question about the originals. And you know, <laughs> the answer is becoming better every time we talk because the idea... Yeah. Which was at the beginning, no, it's becoming a germ and then it's becoming something bigger. So yeah, I, yeah. I gotta be hopeful. One day, one day. If there's <laughs> if there's time enough, I will do it. Yeah, there will be. There will yeah. be. Remember, we are classic and eternal, so it's gonna Absolutely. happen. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> let me see. Okay, people, I know ignoring you as I said. Let me see. Carolina, hello to you. Felipe Brel, hello, Felipe Hernandez, hello, hello to Dave too. Uh, for Felipe says, for me, Watchmen is the comic book between brackets and the ultimate reading experience. I love your pencils and Alan Moore writings. Uh, Felipe Brell, I watched the 2080 podcast with Brian Boland, Mike, McMah Mike McMahon, and Dave. It was superb. What was it like sharing a studio like that? How, how long did it last? <laughs> well, I mean, if, if you've seen the thing that I did with, with Mick, you, you have some idea because we told some stories there of, of uh, what used, used to go on. But it, it was weird because looking back on it it, it, it was something completely different than it felt at the time. I felt at the time that all Mick and I did 
was to fool around and just have stupid arguments with each other and, and, and debate whose turn it was to make the coffee and what we were going to listen to on the radio. But when I look back on it, I think it might have been the fact that you knew that any minute an artist that you really respected would come and look over your shoulder. It really made you want to do your best work, you know. And, and we, we did both create some, I think, some of our best work there. I co-created Rogue Trooper. I drew a lot of sort of Doctor Who episodes, which is still being reprinted to this day. Mick, Mick did a lot of great dread work. He did the full colour Judge Dread annual, which is just, just a real classic. And I think we learned a lot from each other. Mick had been to art school and was quite well trained as a draftsman. I'm kind of self-taught. Mick's a fairly quiet, introspective, uh, um, um, very concentrated, focused artist. I'm a little more happy-go-lucky. And I think, you know, we both felt that the other one had something that we didn't have. Um, so it was a great experience. And we're, we're friends to this day. We don't obviously meet anything like as often. And we were only in the studio for maybe a year and a half. Um, and I know exactly when it was because we were in the studio on the morning that John Lennon got shot. I remember coming into the studio and Mick saying to me, have you heard, you know, it's like one of those things like 9-11 or something. You, you remember where you were when. Yeah. Uh, so it was, I think it was 1980 that, that John Lennon died. So that was that that was the time period there. Um, and we're, we're still friends. And, you know, as I say, I talk a lot. Mick doesn't talk so much. So that's great. He, I talk, he listens, everybody's happy. <laughs> <laughs> you compliment each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We fit, we fit. It's like a nice match. Uh, yeah. Ferran Padilla says, recently watched Watchmen's HBO series during the quarantine. The show was terrific. I enjoyed it very much. Were you involved in it, Mr. Gibbons? If not, what do you think about it? Have you seen it? Well, he's already said five minutes ago he's seen it. But yeah. were you involved in it in any way, Dave? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, was, I haven't been very keen on the prequels and sequels that DC Comics have done. Um, and, of course, the, the Watchmen movie was really an, just an adapt I say just it was an adaptation of what what Alan and I had done but when I met Damon Lindelof and he very respectfully and very solicitously asked me what I thought about doing a TV series and outlined some of the plans he had in mind I felt you know this could be really good because what his plan was was to set it so far away in time from the events of Watchmen although within the same universe mm -hmm. that the ramifications of what had happened and how things had ended up that much later felt completely fresh and, and unex, you know, unexplored. It wasn't like, oh, this is the year after what, what you already know, or this is or, the year before. Or before Watchmen, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was, okay, all this time has gone by, everything's reverberated throughout society, and everything that refers to the comic book is absolutely canon. It absolutely agrees with what Alan and I did in, in the comic book. And... Um, I, I, I thought this sounds like a really good idea. I went along quite early on and visited Damon and the crew in, um, I think it's Burbank. Was it Burbank? Somewhere in Los Angeles anyway. And I had a sneak preview of the pilot and I thought, man, this is great. There's, there's stuff in here. All good fiction does the thing where when you get to what's going on, you think, I never would have thought of that, but it's so obvious you know, it's 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 inevitable, and there was something about what what they did with with with, with Watchmen that that just added a, an undreamt of dimension. I won't say anything because I don't want to spoil it. But there were things that why didn't we think of that? That's yeah. such an obvious obvious thing to do. And the thing I also respected about it was that Damon only did it for the amount of time that it took to tell the story he he, mm -hmm. he wanted to tell. It didn't become an ongoing thing where yeah. it's new adventures of the Watchmen. He had a specific story and, and he did his nine episodes because that's what it took and done. And as yeah. far as I'm aware, he doesn't intend to do any more oh. unless he gets another killer idea. And if he gets another idea as, as killer as that, I want to see it, you know. Um, so there was that. As, as far as my involvement, I did give them some notes after I'd seen the screening. They did send me screenplays, uh, which I gave them some feedback on. I did one piece of artwork. There's a scene where... Um, um, I think it's um, it's um, um, John Osterman is looking through an illustrated Bible and there's a page where it's Adam and Eve 
and mm -hmm. I drew that illustration. And I actually, for the, the people out there who love my new shy, and I know you all do, I didn't do my little trademark G, to, G for Gibbons, to sign it with. I did F, because in the comic book, Tales of the Black Freighter was drawn by Walter Feinberg, and mm -hmm. I reckoned and reasoned that after he'd done his time drawing pirate comics, he tried to redeem himself by doing Bible illustrations so that <laughs> that piece of artwork, even that piece of artwork, falls within what, what we said. Yeah. Um, so I did that, and I also did another quick piece of, of, of artwork for a character called, I think he's called Lube Man, mm -hmm. who's this kind of guy who's lubed up in a kind of la latex suit. And I did a really crude, supposed to be a police drawing of, of this glistening, oily kind of guy disappearing down a sewer. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I, I was involved to a certain degree, but I was really thrilled by it. I, I so much enjoyed it. I mean, it's difficult when you've worked on a thing to have an objective view. But I certainly remember watching kind of episode five and getting completely lost, like we were saying before, completely lost in it and thinking, you know, this is one of the best hours of TV that I've ever watched. So, yeah, yeah, yeah full marks from me. I remember watching it and thinking exactly the same thing. Like, of course, everything, every five seconds, it was, a, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. yeah, yeah. Of course, everything was, of course. Mm -hmm. But then I, then I was like, yeah, of course, but he's the only guy who thought about it, you know? Like, yeah. So it's not that obvious as we see. For him, yes. and I think Damon Lindelof, for whatever shit people get, I think the guy is a genius, you know? And, oh, sure, yeah. And uh, by the end of it, when he said, I'm not doing anything anymore, and HBO says, if Damon doesn't do it, this is not going to have a second, a second season, I said, tip of the hat. He told yeah, his yeah. story, and HBO is respecting him. So, yeah, 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 it's true. It's, it's true. So, yeah, so I, I felt very, very happy with, with, with that. And, and, of course, you know, it is, it is interesting that they took that stance that if Damon didn't want to do it, they wouldn't get anybody else into doing uh -huh. it. This isn't quite what happened in, in the comics, but I think, uh -huh. you know what I mean, we'll, we'll leave that discussion there, I think. Yes. <laughs> with the, the, let's, just, let's just think about what they've said. We won't get in there, but, yeah, it's inter let's, say, let's, let's say it's interesting. Okay? Yes. That's it. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. Right. Uh, uh, ba, 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 ba. Hi, Jose Ramon Solera says, Hi, given the fact that basically Ozymandias create an alien, an alien Armageddon just to give the world something to challenge it and make it stronger, don't you think Johnny Cash did it in a boy named Sue? Uh, don't I think jo Johnny Cash did it in a boy named Sue? I mean, I do know the song of Boy Named Sue, and it's, it's a great song. I, I don't, I've got to be honest, that I don't quite understand the connection. I don't either. But I suppose it's something about by calling your boy Sue, you make him stand up for himself. So yeah. I guess it's kind of a parallel. I've never, ever had that parallel made before. It's very interesting. Wait, wait, wait. He just, he, just, he just explained it. Sorry, in the next question. He says, you know, a father's name, his son, Sue. So he got to constantly fight. And this will make him a strong, kind of rough way, way to get things going, isn't it? Yeah, well... Yeah, I mean, I suppose that's true. Um, I'll have to think about this. I, I, this is something which may be obvious, but I haven't thought of it yet. <laughs> okay, let's keep going. Uh, Felipe González uh, Hernández, how do you remember coming from Britain and magazines to uh, to uh, United, you know, to American comics? Was it a difficult transition to adjust to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, it did, it did have its problems, actually. I mean, basically, I... I'd always wanted to work for particularly DC comics, American comics in general, but DC comics in particular. And I'd been over to New York and, and shown them my samples many years before. And I got the thanks, but no thanks. And so I then used those samples to get work in British comics. But then what eventually happened was the Americans just came over and recruited several of us. You know, they, Dick Giordano and Joe Orlando, invited me and Mick, who we spoke about earlier, to their hotel and said, we want you to work for us. They would give us more money. They would give us um, reprint money. They would give us royalties. They would even give us the board to draw it on. So, I mean, it was a complete no-brainer. It's the company I always wanted to work for, offering me a deal that was far better than the deal I had in England. Oh, and they give us our artwork back, which they didn't in British comics at that yeah. point. So, and I, I'm, I've never been quite clear what they actually wanted me to do. I think they wanted me to draw Star Trek because they knew that I could do science fiction. 
they knew because of Doctor Who that I could do likenesses of actors. But I, I was never formally offered it. And I would never have done it because Star Trek is a nightmare because every page has got to have four or five distinct likenesses on it. And that is tough work. And um, so if, eventually what happened after I'd thrown in all my British work, I was waiting for the scripts to arrive from America. And I phoned up and they said, well, we've got some backup stuff you could do. And if you make a really good job of them, you might even get a lead strip. So I thought, oh, because I sort of was a lead strip artist in, in, in Britain. I'd you know, done Dan Dare, which was on the front of 2000 yep. AD. I'd done Doctor Who, which was a kind of flagship title. And so I started off by doing backups for Green Lantern and for Flash. And that did feel, to be honest with you, a little bit of a demotion. But the Green Lantern stories were just the kind of thing, again, that I'd done for 2018 for Doctor Who. They were short stories where you cre created like a new world every time, which I, I really enjoyed doing. And then, if, and then I must have made a good enough job with them because pretty soon I got all offered the Green Lantern lead mm -hmm. strip. Uh, written by Len Wein, and I did that for a year or so. And, you know, that was when I really felt my American career took off. And, of course, that segued into Watchmen. So, yeah, it was a slightly rocky beginning, but I had no doubt that it was the right thing to do. Okay, let me – this is a fun one. After finishing Watchmen, your next projects were as a writer. Is it true that when uh, – um, that when an artist worked with Alan Moore as, a, as an artist – uh, the artist doesn't go back to pencils for a while. Uh, I don't quite get that. Can, can, you, can you ask me that again in English? <laughs> I think he means that uh, after you finish uh, drawing Watchmen, you, um, you, know, you only did your own writing for a while, not drawing. Yeah. I, I guess it means that for, if it's true that for artists, after having written, uh, after having drawn something written by Alan, you get so burned that you just need to you stop uh, drawing for a while. Um, I, all right, I, I get the question, and that, that wasn't quite how it, it, it wasn't like, oh my god, I'm so I'm so tired of drawing. I can't, you know, all, all my my drawing muscles are burnt out. Please just let me write something. You know, it, it, it wasn't like that. I mean, the thing was, growing up, my ambition was to do comics. And by that, I meant to write and draw them both. And it wasn't until later that I discovered that you had a writer and you had an artist. And when I showed my early samples, of course, you know, you can tell immediately whether somebody can draw. But to work out whether they can write, the editor's got to invest a fair bit of time in it. So mm -hmm. the work that I got immediately was drawing. So the be the benefit of working one of the many benefits of working on Watchmen was that because I, my name was now associated with something which had been such a critical and commercial success it had a kind of what I think they call in the movies a marquee value mm -hmm. in other words if you saw my name on you think ah oh, Watchmen this is going to be as good as Watchmen so I got offered a few things to write and of course I jumped to them and the first thing that I was offered by DC was to write World's Finest which was to write Superman and Batman with a really good artist. So I, I, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was never, never going to turn that down. And then again, in England, I wrote some stuff for 2008. I, I, I wrote a new version of Rogue Trooper, who was a character that I co-created. And yes, there was what the questioner said. There's a certain amount of truth in it. It's like you've got your picture muscles and you've got your word muscles. And it was nice to exercise the other muscles a bit. Um, and again, I was very fortunate because I worked with some great writers, uh, some great artists. And of course, I had picked up a lot by working with Alan because he's a genius, a wonderful storyteller, one wonderful man of vision. And I, I'd also worked with Frank Miller immediately after doing Watchmen, and he's got a different approach. So I'd really learned, learned at the knee of a couple of real masters. So it was a real joy to put some of the stuff I'd learned, not to their level, I would never claim that, but to put some of the lessons I'd learned into, into play and to, you know, be on the other side of the table. That's what I was going to ask. It's got to be, knowing Frank, knowing Alan, it's got to be like completely different brain muscles, to, uh, you know, <laughs> for you to draw, you know. Yeah. Getting what the way Alan draw the lay, I don't even care, you know, about the technique where you know the way Alan works or, or Frank works, you know, even the personalities, you know, that what they what they imbue, if that's a right word, you know, into their work, 
that you get, you know, the, the impression, the feeling you get from what you're, and then I, I got to get into these pages. One is, you know, like Alan, we could say the calculating, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then it's Frank, which is like the, you know, all the, all well, the around. So that's, the, did that affect you as an artist, you know, the kind of mentality of the writer you were working with? Yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 the description that, that I always use, and maybe people have already heard me use it, is that I, if you think about music again, Alan is kind of like Mozart, where he hears the whole symphony in his head mm -hmm. and he orchestrates it completely. There's all the parts, there's all the... Um, I seem to have lost you, but I'll just keep going. No, um, I'm here, I'm here. Yeah, so he's got the whole concerto work, worked out, out in his head. So you as a professional know what tune to play, you know, you've got a, a very close roadmap, which isn't to say that you can't improvise because you can, and Alan would, would encourage you to um, improvise. Whereas Frank is more like a kind of jazz virtuoso, like a Miles Davis, where there is a tune, where there is a melody, and there is a rhythm, but you can change it around. And if you find something interesting while you're playing, you can add that in or move it or, or do something different. So I, I like both the disciplines. It's not that one's more difficult than, than the other. Alan no, but I, didn't, I wasn't asking about that. that, that, that I, I know that I wasn't clear. I mean, oh, no, no, from an empath, em, em, empathy point of view, you know, the yeah. kind of the kind of writing, the kind of, uh, you know, the, what you got on the page, one took you in one direction and the other took you in another direction. You know, one took you in a more uh, calculation, you know, in a more calculation mood, you have to be really strict about things. Mm. And the other is more instinctual, or like you know, like the yeah. just just you, you, you said from Frank, or not at all. Well, it's I, I mean, it's but if you love doing comics and you, you as I do, and you get the chance to work with really good writers, it's a bit like I don't know, being a sportsman and playing in the same game with really top sportsmen. You know, they make your game better. You, uh -huh. you, you have to understand their tactics and, the, and yeah. their approach to it <laughs> yeah. and, and to um, enrich it. And the other thing that I would say is that in a good collaboration, like I had with both Alan and Frank, you kind of let your ego go. You, you don't, if an idea is good, you go with it. If it doesn't happen to be your idea, you go with it anyway. And, and so both Alan and Frank would be, if I had a suggestion or I said, I think maybe there's a better way to do it, they'd accept it without any argument at all. There was no sense, particularly with, with Alan. I know there's a, a, a preconception that he's a hard taskmaster yeah. and everything's detailed and he more or less draws the pictures for you and you just fill in it. It isn't like that at all, yeah. you know. And, and, and um, he's, he's, he's a great, great collaborator. And, you know... Um, I, I look back on both those experiences and the experiences with my other co collaborators as just being joyous. I think there's a thing that's true in comics and in other areas of life as well, that the really good people are great to be with and are great to work with. It's only those of slightly lesser talents who are difficult. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's leave it there. Uh... Uh, no, 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 no. I love where finds with Steve Ruth. I think it's one of your best work. Did you have an intention to draw it or only write in it? Um, I really just wanted to write it. I mean, it was offered to me as having Steve Ruth attached to it. And really, I immediately I thought this is going to look great. And I mean, when I was a kid growing up in England, um, we only used to get the, the reprints of DC Comics. So there'd be all the Superman titles and all the Batman titles. But there was only that one title, which was called World's Finest in the States, but in England was called Super Adventure Comics, mm -hmm. where the two characters met. And that to me was absolutely magical that these two universes that were quite separate in their own comics could, could cross over. So just the very notion of that thrilled me. And although I didn't draw that, um, just to tell you a quick story of when I was younger and, you know, obsessed with the idea of comics, and my dad took me to see the local artist. And I think every town's got a local artist. He was like a bit of a freaky kind of guy who wore sandals and smoked strange, strange cigarettes and wore a, a funny hat. And he was the local artist. And my dad took me along to see him, obviously to see whether I had any artistic talent. And he t my dad said, what you've got to bring is what you're drawing at the moment. But what I was drawing at that moment was I got a huge sheet of paper and I was redrawing line for line 
an issue of World's Finest. I was literally doing it line for line, copying it. But I turned Superman into Atom Man and Batman into Birdman. But otherwise, it was a line for line copy. And of course, the joke was that the story, the villain in the story was called the Duplicate Man. So, you know, and I remember taking it along to the local artist and I can remember the smell of oil paints and everything because he wasn't a comic artist, he was a, an artist. And <laughs> him and my dad going off into a huddle where obviously I can't remember what was said, but it must have been something like, well, he's put a lot of work into it, but it's clearly copied. I don't see any great originality here. And that was a reasonable thing to say. And it was a reasonable bit of information for my parents to act on. Although in later years, they became very proud of what I had managed to do. Um, so, you know, the idea of World's Finest is, is looms large in my legend, as, as, as they say. And uh, um, I was really happy with the way it turned out because I was able to, I think, sort of dig quite deep into the characters and figure out what made them similar but different. The whole thing of being orphans, the whole thing of... Well, in, an, in, an, in a nutshell, Batman has seen his parents gunned down in the street in front of him. He's seen them bleed to death. He knows for a fact they're dead. They're not coming back. All he's got left in his mind is vengeance. Superman, on the other hand, knows intellectually that Krypton exploded. But there has always been hope that maybe it didn't. Or maybe there was a little bit left where his parents were still alive. Or certainly he got to meet his cousin, Kara. So there's... That's, to me, they're both orphans, but one of them has been left with a life of despair and one of them has been left with a life of hope. So that, so on that high-flown level, that was my underpinning to the story. And then it involved a lot of going backwards and forwards, you know, to have the Joker in Metropolis and Lex Luthor in Gotham. So it was a lot of fun to do, but the best bit of it really was Steve's artwork, I think. <laughs> okay, let's go. Um... Did you plan, Lord Frank Howard asked, did you plan the drawing style in your story with Superman in any special way? I, I guess he means, you know, like to try to be more classical, like the classic Superman uh, artist. Uh, um, did you see, did you base your, your style for that book in any classic Superman author or you just kept, you know? No, well, I mean, I, 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 I've always loved Superman as, as a character. He, you know, he is the granddaddy of, of them all. He, he's the sun around which all the other planets revolve really and um it had always been an ambition to draw superman and it just it was wonderful that the chance that i got involved superman obviously it also involved alan moore who was and is you know a, a, a genius at comics and it was also edited by julius schwartz who had edited a lot of my favorite comic books growing up all the flash and green man and the justice league and, and so on so it was an absolutely wonderful moment in kind of space and time that I got to do it but I wanted to do it not in not mimicking any other Superman artist I mean I'd done some Batman stuff where I tried to do it in the style of Dick Sprang who was the good Batman artist and I I love Kurt Swan I used to love Wayne Boring and Al Plastino and all these these classic artists but I tried to draw it in a way as if I was drawing it for 2000 AD or something so with the same kind of drawing style that I would have used for that um, and um, I did also have in mind, Alan and I spoke about the way that it was weird because, you know, as I say, I, I love the classic Superman artist, but one of my favourite Superman stories growing up wasn't actually a Superman story. It was the Mad Comics parody of Superman called Super Duper Man. Oh. And, uh, and, and it was drawn by Wally Wood over Harvey Kurtzman's layouts. And it, and it involved S Super Duper Man fighting Captain Marvel's. And it was drawn as if it was three-dimensional. It had all that wonderful Wally Wood lighting on it. So I tried to bring a little flavour of that to it. And in the, the fight scenes where Mongol is tromping Superman, I tried to give it a, a kind of a weighty Wally Wood kind of feeling to it. But I basically found the story so good and the script so inspirational that it was, it was really... It's one of my favourite things that I've ever done. And one of those, as I say right place right time really that uh, felt like you know the two the two superman stories Holland did you know this one and um whatever happened to the man whatever happened yeah. that felt like the end well it was yeah. away the end of the silver age uh, yeah. superman yeah. um well it, it it was fantastic because 
that's the Superman that Alan grew up on. Just, yeah, just that's what I was going to ask. If for you, and, Alan, not not only for Alan, for you. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, the homage to the Superman you grew up with. You knew, you know, they're changing it. It's going to be burn Superman. It's going to be a different thing. This yeah. is our one and only chance yeah. to and pay homage to our Superman. And of course, what what Alan did, just to leave me, me out of the equation, what Alan did with for the man who has everything and for the whatever happens to the man of tomorrow. It was more or less one of the best Superman stories ever. And it was like, okay, follow that. Yeah. And, <laughs> so he, he, I mean, I think John Byrne was in his, was up to the task and yeah, you know, not to not what, what John did on it, but it, but it was kind of a hell of an act to follow that, that, that Alan left him with. Yeah. But was it that, as, as I was asking, was it that for, for you, I'm not asking about Alan that he's not here, so I'm asking you. Uh, it's uh, for you. It was uh, like an homage. It's like it, this is the time where I can homage the Superman I've always loved. I grew up with. This is my chance. I'm going to pull all my pull non stops on it. You know, yeah. Pay homage to you know oh, yeah, the character yeah. I grew up with. And of course, what was also great about it was that it was a one-off story. It was a long story. It was a forty-page annual. So we did it all in one. It wasn't like being committed to doing a whole year's worth of, of, of continuity and, and having all the problems of doing that. It was a concentrated burst and it was the classic, it was your classic Superman, Batman, Robin, one Wonder Woman, a classic s Superman villain in the Fortress of S Solitude with Candor, the Bottle City, <laughs> you know. So it was, it was that, and, and indeed the, the other story that Alan wrote, Whatever Happened to the Man Tomorrow, that's set largely in the Fortress of Solitude. So it was like everything being encapsulated in that classic Superman world. Um, and of course, what was wonderful as well was that the, the, the other Superman story was drawn by Kurt Swan. So it had that authenticity to it. So uh, yeah, that, that, that was a real happy job. And of course, we were doing it while we were also working in the background on Watchmen, we were doing the plotting and we were doing the character designs and everything for Watchmen. So um, we had the luxury of plenty of time. We weren't on a hard deadline. We sort of did it and then worked on something else and worked a bit more on it. So it, it was, yeah, I, re I remember the, however long it took me to do it, the three or four months were some of my favorite working months ever, I think. Mm -hmm. uh some uh, log friend asked, what other <laughs> comics written by Alan would you have uh, loved to uh, to draw? Um, well, I mean, imagine, you, to... imagine, I'm going to change the question. Imagine you never do, you never drew a Watchmen. Yeah. But you had to chance to pick, uh, the chance to pick any other stuff to work with Alan that, you know, no, no, you have, you can't go back to the, back to the past. And, oh, I, sh I saw that. Uh, you know what? I'm going to pick back in the day to draw that book which one yeah well i you know i think what alan is is really good at it's, it comes back to what, what i said earlier because he's got a very strong visual sense he writes to an artist i can't imagine watchman not drawn by me it would not have been watchman i mean you could have got a hundred different artists yeah. and it would have been something else i can't imagine v for vendetta drawn by anybody other than david lloyd I can't imagine anything like Bo Jeffries drawn by anybody other than Steve Parkas. Mm -hmm. So I think I could have had a go at V for Vendetta and mm -hmm. I could have done something at, or the Bo Jeffries or Halo Jones, but it wouldn't have been the same. Again, it's what we were saying earlier, David, it's that chemistry. Yeah. It's this plus that is more than this plus that. And um, I would, I, I, you know, he writes such good scripts and he does it. He's such a wonderful collaborator mm -hmm. that I would have left with the chance to do anything but I do really think that me doing a classic Superman story with him and mm -hmm. something that was groundbreaking and that was tailor-made for me to draw that was about as much as I could I could hope for and I'm just really pleased to have the other things on my shelves as drawn by David Lloyd and Steve Parkhouse and, and all those yeah, people absolutely. so yeah absolutely. I'm quite happy with what I managed to do thank you I know I know but that, that wasn't the, that wasn't the point of the question the point of the question is just imagine going to the past and say hey you know what I would have loved to draw that one too not separate from yeah and I mean I, I, again yeah as, as I say just to work with, with 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 Alan because one of the things when you're drawing comics sometimes you get scripts that you know n not very much thought has, has gone into you know we all find ourselves crunched we all sometimes let work go out of the door there could be a bit more 
But the problem with being an artist is if you get a bad script that some writer has knocked off in an afternoon, you've then got to spend the next month or two drawing it. And if, if it's not a good script, that can be soul destroying. It's like he, he does or he or she doesn't care. And I do. But really, I'm, I'm losing the, the will to do this because mm -hmm. it, it could it could be so much better. Having said that, some of the biggest stylistic breakthroughs I've made have been on scripts that I haven't really liked because you get in the mindset, I can only make this better. I, uh -huh. really, can't, I really can't make it worse. And it almost feels like a release. One of the things about an Alan script or a Frank Miller script is it's so good you don't want to screw it up because <laughs> they put so much in, in, into it, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a funny old business. Yeah. Um, if, if, they, if you were told, like, right now, lockdown is over. Right. Go out. What's the first thing you would do? Uh, I would I'd go and have a nice meal in a nice restaurant. And I would go and have a drink in a pub with some friends. And I'd probably go to the movies as well. And then I'd probably go shopping, you know, go and actually be in a shopping centre and maybe buy myself a couple of shirts or, or something. Because that all feels so normal. I mean, you know, it's a <laughs> thing that, 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 that you wouldn't even have, even have thought of. But I think that's what I do. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, as I say, I'm, I'm able to get some exercise and I'm able to enjoy the, the sunshine. So in a sense, I don't feel I've been kind of locked in. But although it'd be great to go to the seaside, it'd be lovely to see the waves and to feel, feel the sea breeze. Yeah. But uh, yeah, those are the kind of ordinary, everyday... Oh, you could everybody... like to do a regular, go back to just doing a regular, normal human being. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the stuff that we would do and not even care about, stuff we might even grumble about doing, like, oh, God, we've got to go around the supermarket. Just to walk around the supermarket and browse and not w worry if you're two metres away from the next person and use a mask or do whatever it is you, you're going to have to do. All those ordinary things, I, I think... I think, again, to come back to what I was saying, it's kind of, it puts it into focus a bit more. Things that seem to chore or seem nothing are actually a bit of a privilege. Yeah. You know? I just think about, you know, having the chance to get out and take my daughter to have lunch to a restaurant. Sure. We used to do it every Saturday or Sunday. I just took her out for lunch while Paloma rest at home. You know, like, leave me alone. You're going on your own. I'm going to rest yeah. home, you know. Rest from the kid and from you. Absolutely. So, yeah, I, 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 and, you know, she, she always asks for, you know, their mac, her mac and cheese and um, <laughs> and uh, what? Albondigas. How do you say in English? Sorry. Uh, for, well, it doesn't matter. You know, with her mac and cheese and that stuff, her ice cream, I spent a couple hours. Yeah. Got back home. That thing, you know, yeah. that's the privilege that I mean. Yeah. That having that two hours with my daughter in a... Oh yeah, I, so they can have her mac and cheese. I, I I used to love love that. It was in in my son's case. It was it was we used to go to McDonald's on a Friday night for exactly the the same reason. It was my turn to look after him for a bit. And you do things like that have a have a huge value. And again, I would have to say with this whole lockdown thing. I mean, I'm I'm I'm, I'm an old guy who stays in his house anyway. But I do feel sorry for the younger people who are missing out on really important life experiences, you know, going to uni, growing up, being able to play without worrying about, about anything. Yeah. So, you, you, you know, my, my thoughts go out to them as, 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 as well. And, you know, as you're saying, just the normal family things you would do without, without even a thought. But they will come back. But, um, oh, yeah. you know. Just, there will be a vaccine sooner or later, you know. Yeah, yeah. We'll, so we'll, we'll just have to be hopeful and have patience and not screw it up. Yeah, this this comes back again in three months. Absolutely, that's that's the fear, I think. Let me go to another subject: technology. Technology. You've been, you know, exploring technology, you know, in, in comics in many ways. Uh, and when I called you an innovator in my ad, I wasn't I wasn't kidding. And you know, you were involved in May Fire and all the things too. Uh, this is something that comes very often in the, in these chats because I'm really angry about how comics. Uh, keep trying to do digital, a carbon copy of what they do in printed comics. Right. And I yeah. keep talking about the format. You know, some of the artists I rep and some of the artists I talk to, I always have the same conversation is they, publishers complain that there's a plateau, you know, like, oh, you know, comic reading for digital comics 
it's not growing. It's, mm. it's, it's not worth it because it doesn't grow. And I keep going back. If you keep trying to give them the same comic you give them in print, they are always going to go to print. Yeah, they are not yeah. going to care. You know, guided view and all those, they're nice. But why don't you use the format of a digital screen in your benefit? Why don't you just break the rules? Yeah. Create new rules because comics is going to be comics, but you just have to adapt yeah. to, the, to, the, to the landscape, to the format. What do you think about that? Uh, well, I think that's true. I mean, with, with Made Fire, you know, we had a way of uh, telling stories in a way that took a lot from comics, but also did things that comics couldn't do, that it could have. Mm -hmm atmospheric sound it could have transitions that you couldn't do in comics while still being and this this is a crucial thing still being a reading experience mm -hmm. you chose the speed at which you read it you could go back backwards and forwards you could study the study the artwork maybe even more than you could study it in a in a regular print comic and and you know we had lots of high hopes for that i mean M made fire is still going yeah. the fact is that that it is a different business model as well because it's slightly more labour intensive to add all these elements to it, um, and so I think um, those possibilities are still there. And I think as software gets more intuitive and as people get the ability to broadcast their their, their own stuff, that there are going to be more and more novel approaches to using the kind of comic book um, approach. I mean, there was the other company that, that, that I was involved in as well, which was Magic Leap, mm -hmm. who unfortunately, given the current circumstances, have had to reappraise their business model uh, a lot, although they are still going and they will be back. And they've got the ability to integrate virtual comics into the real world so that you can, you know, I spoke earlier about losing yourself in a comic and walking yeah. through it. You can do that. You can have a massive comic book page in your room and you can walk through it, you can, you can immerse yourself in it. And it's really quite stunning. And that actually, the technology works hand in hand with Madefire, that if you export it from Madefire, you can go directly into Magic Leap. And you can do some quite astonishing things. I've got some test versions of what we've done with um, Magic Leap and uh, Made, Madefire, and they are really mind-blowing. I can't, the unfortunate thing is I can't demonstrate them to you because you have to be wearing the equipment to, to see them. But I think the whole field of 3D computing and 3D storytelling and integrating the virtual with, with the real is going to become more and more important. And I think that what comic book guys have got and girls is, is a really good understanding of how to economically tell stories in words and pictures. And that's what I've also found with the video games as well, that I know how to impart a lot of information and a lot of character and a lot of drama in a very economical way. And finally, what, what I would say is one of the things that attracted me to, to comics was that it's all you really need to do comics is a piece of paper and a, a pen. Mm -hmm. And the only other thing you need is talent, which you can develop and you, and you can work on. As technology gets cheaper and cheaper and more accessible, never going to be as cheap as a piece of paper and a pencil. But it means people can dive in, publish their own stuff directly to, to, to the world at very little initial outlay other than their own time and their own talent. So I think that is very enabling to creative people, that it does enable them to reach the audience in a very, very quick and very economical way. So... Yeah, so I'm, I'm a great proponent of technology, both creatively and as part of the business model as well. Yeah, I keep, you know, I keep hearing from people that you know, uh, digital comics limit you, and I keep saying, no, it's the other way around. They don't mm -hmm. limit you. They, the, the possibilities are endless. You know, Apple just incorporated a fucking LiDAR in, a, in, in an iPad, a LiDAR. Mm -hmm. So imagine the possibilities of that, you, you know, joined with what you just said with Mayfire and Magic Leap. Imagine a LiDAR where you can just... You know, map and locate every yeah. single element. Yeah. You know, your machine is gonna read the room, and if you have that program that has the information, it, it can it can just send it to your room. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I've got a Magic Leap device here, and I've had lots of demos on it, and it is it's a thing which feels really strange, but it's very intuitive, much more intuitive really than looking at a, a flat screen. Yeah. Way, way, and and that I've seen teleconferencing they've done, and I've seen a thing that they did, which was 
an actor doing Shakespeare where they have volume captured him, motion captured him, and you can have him stand on your table and act Shakespeare. Or you can have him life size and walk around and look at him and look at look at the scenery. And it's it's a really easy thing to be creative in. And it's also a great thing for shared experiences, not just these kind of solitary experiences like reading or, or viewing a, a TV or something, but to be in an, in an arena and to share virtual effects with people. I think it's going to be a, a huge part of entertainment in, the, in, in the future. Absolutely. So, yeah. And, and again, I mean, basically what, what, what we do in comics is tell stories. And I think no matter what the technology, no matter what the time, people yeah. are always going to want stories. Absolutely. And uh, to put it, to add to what you just said, you know, there Apple is working, as you know, in augmented reality in a big way. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the flat screen. Probably in two years, with the with the lidar, with the augmented reality, you know, glasses, you and I are going to see each other face to face, sitting down in our rooms sure. in 3D. Sure, and as and as far as the audience is concerned, we will be in the same room. Exactly. You know, you know? Exactly. Yeah. so those possibilities are endless. You know, and you have an iPad with the Apple Pencil that is, you know, the educational iPad, as they call it, yeah. for 300, 300 uh, pounds, I think now. Yeah. So the possibilities for, you know, students to become really, really uh, uh, interested in working their art in that machine yeah. and are open to new possibilities. Sure. And, and I think the other thing about it is, well, not, not only is it easy to get easier to get your stuff seen by the marketplace, yeah. but the range of educational stuff, the ability to make contact with other creative people for writers to find artists and artists to find writers is unparalleled. I mean, when, when I grew up living in a little village in the middle of England, how was I ever going to get to draw comics for DC in New York? I mean, the fact that I did is still a thing of wonder to me but nowadays i would be on that internet and my artwork would, would be up there and i'd be corresponding with people in the states other people that i knew would find their way into dc they bring me into the you know there's there's all these ways that it that, that it can work now and of course even when you're doing traditional comics the tremendous difference that software has made to the production of comics oh, yeah. to, to the shipping of artwork i mean I used to spend an afternoon making up a big parcel and getting Xeroxes of everything in case it got lost by FedEx that I, I'd have a copy of it. You don't have to do any of any of that now. So, yeah, I, you know, te technology has made a huge difference. I mean, still at the end of the day, when it comes to drawing on the computer, it's still only a tool. It, yeah. it, it, it won't do it for you. Exactly. Um, but, but it will do so many things that used to take a lot of creative time away. No. So, yeah, the future, I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if they have anything else to say. Um, blah, 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 blah. Meatballs, thank you. Macaroni with meatballs. Uh, that yep. was the one. Uh, I meatballs. Thank you, Father Carolina. See <laughs> 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 no, no other thing. Um, um, uh, how was the experience? Oh, yeah, we haven't mentioned Millar. How was the experience of working with Mark Millar? What surprised you about his writing style? Um, well, you know... I've got a tremendous amount of respect for Mark because he has literally, as we say, pulled himself up by his own bootstraps. I was just saying about growing up in, uh, in England and wanting to be a comic book artist. Mark, from the age of about 12, did everything he could to become, first of all, a comic book artist, but then when he realised that maybe his art wasn't his strong suit to become a comic book writer. And what Mark is the master of is, is kind of self-promotion. He knows exactly. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> he, he knows exactly how good he is, and he knows exactly how to pitch things. And he's very, very creative when it comes to that. Unfortunately, he's got the talent to back it up as well. And mm -hmm. um, I've always loved his stuff. He, I mean, famously, he wrote me a fan letter when he was about sixteen and told me that he sort of really liked Watchmen, and my next career move should be to work on this script that he'd written. And I wrote, I have no I memory so, of that. But I am he, so not surprised. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I apparently sent him a very gracious letter back and I did him a sketch as well and kind of thought, oh, well, you know, seems, seems an enterprising young guy. Didn't think much about it. And then I started to see his name cropping up in particularly DC comics. He wrote a lot of kind of Adventures of Superman, which were yeah. Superman stories aimed at a younger generation. So 
quite simple stories, but really well told stories showing real understanding of the character and the magic and the mythos of Superman. Yeah, so Scott McCloud's was first and then it was him and both of their runs on that book, yeah, Superman Adventures was amazing. Was yeah. amazing. And and so and and then I bumped into him at conventions and and for a long while he was friends and collaborated with um, um, Grant Morrison, who I knew of yeah. as well. And, and you know, um, Mark and I kind of took to each other. And what always happens when you meet a kindred spirit, you say, wouldn't it be great to do something together? And we've been saying that for a while. And then Mark said, oh, I've got this thing that I've been working on with Matthew Vaughan, the film director. And it's like the new James Bond. And I thought, oh, that, that sounds interesting. I've, I've done science fiction i've done you know superheroes and, but i've never done spy stories that'd be really good to do so we started work on that there were a few hiccups along the way because then matthew decided he was going to make a film out of the kingsman stuff so we had the comic book on the one hand and the movie on the other and they were kind of the same story but not quite so one wasn't an adaptation of the other which again gave us great freedom and the thing that i like about mark's work is he he gets the job done. He knows exactly how to sell a scene. And he's a master of the moment, you know, the memorable moment where you think, what a line or what a great shot. Um, so, yeah, so we really enjoyed working together on that. And we've got, we've had two movies out of it. There's a third one, which is all in the can, which is obviously waiting to be, to be released. And I'm hoping that, the, I've got no inside knowledge of this, but I'm hoping that there will be another one as well, because I'd really like to see a third because there are the two original movies with Colin Firth and Taron Egerton, yeah. and and then the one that's in the can is is about World War One, about the origins of yeah. of the Kingsman. I want to see another one where it's Taron kind of as 007, as although it's not not James Bond. I'd like to make that clear, but as the equivalent of yeah of of uh, as, the, the season, as the season of best yeah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. yeah the man you know so he yeah. is now the man. <laughs> And I think there's a great movie there, and that would make a perfect little little set of movies. So I'm, ho I mean, I'm, I'm not good. I don't think Mark can write any more Kingsman because of his contract with Netflix, and I've got no plans to draw anymore. But we we have had some issues drawn by, and written by other people. So I think the comic franchise will keep going, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll get to see the movie that's in the can, and hopefully another movie after that. Have you ever thought about writing Kingsman yourself or Secret Service? Um. I could. I, I, I really wouldn't want to I always do that. Thought it was, I always thought there's a story there, you know, for Dave to tell. There's got to be from knowing you since, the, since you just started doing the book, I always thought there's got to be one story that Dave has in his head that he has to write. I, you know, I've never actually thought of that. But, I, you know, again, it's weird with ideas. Now, now that you've said that, some little part of my brain is thinking, yeah, Kingsman, I wonder what could, that, could happen there. So... We'll we'll see. No, no plans at the moment, but never say never. Isn't that a James Bond film? No, no. no. Ne never say never again. Or I am a bastard who gives you the bad ideas. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. Um, oh, how much time are we have we doing this? One hour and a half. Yeah. Uh, how about maybe two two more questions? Yes, two more questions. This we got a storm here. Started raining. Whoa, like crazy. Um, you guys are not asking questions, so I'm going to ask them myself. Oh no, wait, that's one key. Lock from Howard. How was your time at, at 2008? Uh, did you enjoy did you enjoy it? Oh, 2008 was great. I mean, again, so much of my career and so much of my contemporaries' career is sort of good timing. I mean, 2008 came along at just the time when all us fans who had grown up reading comics and had aspired to do comics were sort of professionally competent to, to, to do them. So it was almost like a big club. You know, most of the writers, most of the artists knew each other. We'd hang out together. We'd try and take our artwork in on the same day so we could meet up and go and go and have a few drinks. And yeah, I, and of course it also got our work seen by the uh, American market as well. And thanks to Kevin O'Neill, who was the art editor at the time, all the artwork ended up being credited. So we all started to get some kind of fan following and some sort of re reputation. So everything kind of fell into place. We even got our artwork back eventually. And I've got nothing but fond memories of working for 2000 AD. 
Um, and, you know, the fact that it's still going, it's just incredible that, what is it, 40 years, more than 40 years later, it's yeah. still going. I mean, comics in England on the newsstand typically last four or five years on a, on a, if you're really lucky. The fact that it's still going. I mean, it was, it was really interesting. They had a, I think it was the 40th anniversary, was it, of 2018? Mm -hmm. And they did a special weekend convention. So there were all us writers and artists all in our kind of 60s. And there was all the, all the uh, readers all in their 50s. So we've all sort of grown up together. Um, and yeah, and I still get sent it every, every week. And like anything that's gone on for geological amounts of time, it, it, it has its ups and downs, but it's still a really good comic. And I, I, I'm just really proud and pleased to have been a part of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's next for you? Um, well, as I say, we've got the after the, the game, after the game, the game called Beyond the Steel Sky on Apple. Remember Arcade. Beyond oh. the Steel Skies, Apple Arcade coming oh. hopefully in June. Yeah, don't we know where you live. If you don't get it, we're going to chase you. Okay, that, well said, David. Thank you, uh, thank you. Check <laughs> check in the post. Um, um, well, the next thing, the thing I have been working on or had been working on for a couple of years on and off was my autobiography. And um, we've got a publisher for that. Nice. But unfortunately, again, all this lockdown happened just at the point at which contracts were going to be signed. So it will come out. The publishers will publish it. But we're at that point where until we've got contracts signed, we can't really move ahead in it. But I've written the whole thing and it comes out to be about 100,000 words, which is fairly good for an autobiography. It's not a chronological biography. It's what I call an anecdotal autobiography so it's it's essays on things that have had some relevance to my career in comics it's purely a professional autobiography it doesn't go into all my family details and my ancestors and my school days and all that kind of thing um but it's it it answers i think a lot of questions like the questions i've been asked today it does go into some areas that i'm not really talked much about that i'm now kind of giving my side of I, i haven't got any grudges i haven't got any debts to repay i'm not trying to op open old wounds but there, there have been things that have been written that aren't quite accurate and i'm trying to put my side of what actually happened so that should be of interest to people um and uh, i'm going to illustrate it with hopefully artwork that isn't too familiar i mean apart from the stuff that i'm sure most people have seen I, over the years, I've done a lot of advertising work and I've done some album covers and I've done posters and things. So we, we're going to try and, uh, you know, not just have the same artwork that, that everybody's seen before. So I don't know when that will be out, but we're still hopeful that maybe I don't think it's going to be this year. I don't think that could happen. But hopefully around this time next year, it will it will be on sale and uh, it'll give people a whole new lot of questions to ask me when I do gigs like this. <laughs> I, 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 for one, uh, really want to read it. Although I know some of those things, I guess. But, you know, that doesn't matter. I want to read it. I want to read it. Uh, so, my friend, it's been, let me see, what, 92 minutes. It's fine. We said That's an hour. That's a long time. It flew by. It flew by. I'm happy you liked it. I did. Uh, I did. So always, always, always a pleasure to talk, David. Now, the last time we, we, we met, you actually sent me some lovely Spanish food. Yes. But you needn't do that this time, okay? You're sure? I'm sure. I'm sure. Because and, you know I'm ready. And you also I love, I love my will take like in, no, in, no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. And, and and you also introduced us to cloudy wine, which uh -huh. which we really liked, and yeah. which is as you know, Mitch Jarrad gave us his two bottles of of, of um, cloudy wine to bring home with us. So I've got very fond memories, and my stomach's got very fond memories of the last time we met. So it, it is a pleasure to talk to you, David, and hopefully we'll be able to see each other for real soon. Oh, yes, absolutely, really soon. Don't don't hang up. Uh, let me, uh, I want to say paper goodbye until we got the connection first. Okay, I'll, so I'll everybody... stick around. And thanks to everybody for watching and thanks for some good questions and uh, keep watching. Yes, thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here. I'm going to see about the storm behind me uh, and um, we'll see you here on Monday at a very weird time 1 p.m. a la una with uh, Mr. Brian Michael Bendis okay really? have, a, have a really great weekend and um, love you all bye gonna cut the feed in three